The Berlin Board of Education Committed to continuous improvement um, I'd like to call this meeting to order That's amazing. Yeah. And uh, we'll start with the Pledge of Allegiance, please you to Griswold School. This evening we have a student presentation, so I'm going to pass this off to David. Very excited to showcase for you tonight our jazz band. To recognize Colorectal Cancer Awareness Month, which is March. Last week, our students participated in a fundraiser, and they raised over $300 for colorectal cancer awareness. Uh, and we're really proud of their efforts to make our community a better place. Uh, but we're also wearing these just to um, bring it up as a discussion point. Um, so jazz band. It's truly a pleasure to showcase these students. Uh, they are students who they need authentic audiences. That's why I really appreciate you all being here tonight. Uh, these kids, um, in the fall, it's open to all of our fifth grade who play in band. Um, uh, some fourth graders who have previous experience with their instrument also join, but they begin playing band in fourth grade. In the spring, it's open to all fourth and fifth graders, and we currently have 32 members in our jazz band. What you see up here, though, are representatives um, from our fall jazz band. Some of them. We've had a case of strep throat going through the school, so we've lost a few members as recently as 20 minutes ago. Um, but they learned these numbers you're going to see tonight in the fall, and that's why they volunteered to come back and practice. They sacrifice a lot to be a part of the jazz band. Um, they come early in the morning for early morning practice. They stay after school for afternoon adventures. They give up recess on their own choosing twice a week um, to practice. They uh, go home and use their smart music program, which Ms. Wilson monitors from remotely and provides them feedback. They really go above and beyond. And um, I think it's because I don't have a lot of, I don't have a musical bone in my body that I'm in such awe of what they do. Um, but without further ado, I want to introduce Ms. Allison Wilson. She's our 2018-2019 Teacher of the Year at Griswold School, um, and she is the um, organizer of our jazz band. And Board of Ed members, if you want, why don't you come out and have a seat out here. For you. Um, the tunes that you're going to hear tonight are two tunes that we did on our January concert. We were working on them all through the fall, and we're ho also hoping to um, perform at the high school later on in June for their Jazz with Pizzazz with this group and our next our jazz band that just started um, the, this spring, and they'll be performing uh, in our spring concert um, at the end of May. Um, so the group you see before you is mostly fifth graders, one fourth grader over here on piano who's done some private lessons in the past. And um, we also have a few adults in the group. Sometimes I um, ask people to fill in on instruments that we don't currently have. Um, sometimes the adults like to just come and play because uh, they're actually 
pretty good students. Um, we have uh, in the back, we have Mr. Yance. He's a, a father of Maggie Yance playing trumpet, both of them. Also a music educator uh, up in Burlington, Harlington re um, School District. And then we have Aiden Garneau. You'll be hearing him on trombone on a solo on one of our pieces tonight. We have Liam uh, Gaffney on trombone as well. And we have Olivia Noakes on trombone in the back. In the back, we have Mr. Norton, who's sitting with us, sitting in with us tonight um, to fill in for Mr. Sheldon, who is one of our IT guys. Um, Mr. Sheldon usually plays for our concert, couldn't make it tonight, so thank you so much. Also, um, Mr. Norton is a parent of one of our fifth grade drummers. Um, and then we have, uh, stand up, because we can't see you behind the music. This is Adrian. He's um, playing, Adrian Gravick is playing uh, piano tonight. We have Gretchen Perot on drums. We have Julia Grabic in the front row on alto saxophone. We have our very own fifth grade teacher, Miss Bodette, who is also um, trained as a music educator for her undergraduate, and then also does um, teaches fifth grade, so she does a little bit of everything. She's my right hand lady. Uh, she helps me out with all the jazz band rehearsals, and um, as does uh, Mr. Yance in the back. And then we have Lillian Cookson. So Lillian's playing alto. Um, when we start um, jazz band, one of the one of the favorite things is that it swings, and so instead of playing everything straight and boring and the way that it has to be in band rehearsal and lessons, they like jazz because they can be a little more creative. We all learn the j uh, blues scale, and then we learn how to swing the eighth notes so that you know you get that big band feel, and they all learn how to do improvisation, which is, some kids love it and other kids are scared of it. Um, and Lillian's gonna demonstrate that for us, but we take that scale and then we learn little patterns um, on, with, with swinging the eighth notes and doing some doodads and such, and those patterns become like little vocabulary words and then they put them together and then it's just like learning how to read and learning how to speak and then they start speaking more words and more sentences and more ideas and then they start borrowing ideas from each other as they Im improvise and sometimes you're improvising solos during the, during the actual tunes Sometimes they're written out solos. Um, you'll hear some more difficult solos tonight that were actually written out. And so Lillian's gonna kind of demonstrate our end result of doing some, uh, some improvisation. So you wanna stand up and, and give, it, give us a little bit of a taste of that. <laughs> probably have all heard um, on the radio and the movies. Um, it's called Take the A-Train by Billy Strayhorn.
piece uh, is going to feature a solo on the drums. And again, it's going to be a, a swing tune that you're probably familiar with. It's called Sing, 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 and it's by Louis Prima. We want to thank the band. We don't often get to get entertained in this way. So congratulations. Thank you very much. Thank you. We look forward to your spring concert. Yep, May 22nd, 23rd. Write them down. Yep, May 22nd, 23rd. Okay, next up on our agenda, we have committee reports, correspondence to the board. 
We're going to look down the hall here and look to Jenna. Jenna, you're on. I see you're solo tonight. Yes. Alex is practicing for his Mr. VHS act. He will be singing Hallelujah, he wanted me to mention. So Mr. VHS is on Sunday at 6 p.m. in the auditorium. And this past weekend, the Youth and Government Conference was held, and the junior Dawson Trotman was selected as the 76th Youth Governor throughout like the entire state of Connecticut. So also this week, the SAT day is for juniors is on Wednesday, and parent conferences is also after school. And Unified Theater will present their channel surfing play on March 29th, also in the auditorium. So. Thank you, Jenna. Mr. BHS, huh, Sunday? Yes. He's singing. He wanted me to mention it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I know earlier today we had a student achievement committee meeting uh, about the uh, school calendar. Rich, I'm going to take your thunder away because we're going to move it right down to the agenda because we're going to cover it there anyway. Great so. stuff to say, too. All right. Oh, well, if, if that's the case, no, you're on. Go ahead. Go ahead. Correspondence to the board. We have no correspondence to the board this evening, but if I could just recognize Jenna for being recognized as the first chapter of the Rho Kappa um, Social Studies Honor Society. Uh, we had that ceremony last week, and uh, congratulations, Jenna. Congratulations, congratulations. Jenna. <laughs> uh, next up, we have audience of citizens. Is there anyone who would like to address the Board of Education this evening? No one's waving their arms, jumping up and down, going once, going twice, closed to audience <coughs> of citizens. All right, next up we have the consent agenda, but we have an addition to the consent agenda. So I will need a motion to add this item to the consent agenda. Move to add um, a request for leave of absence at Emma Hart Willard School to the consent agenda. Do I need to read the whole thing? Nope. Okay. I have a motion by Carrie. Second. Second. Second by Adam. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. Eight. Eight zero. With that, we move to the consent agenda. Is there anybody who would like to uh, remove or discuss anything from the consent agenda since we just added something? Seeing nothing, I will entertain a motion. I'll move to approve the consent agenda as presented. Motion by Jamie. Second by Carrie. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries 8-0. We're moving right along. We're going to try to set a new record here. All right. <laughs> Next up, we have new business. Uh, School-based health services is first on here. I turn it over to Mr. Benigni. I'm going to ask Ms. Holine if she could speak on this, please. Just we move yeah. so that we can see the, the jazz band's a tough act to follow, I think. I'm Jane Hyland. I'm the director of school-based health for the Community Health Center. The Community Health Center is a federally qual qualified health center network. We have 14 primary care sites throughout Connecticut, uh, down Norwalk all the way up to New London and everywhere in between. But tonight we're going to talk about school-based health.
There we go. Um, I have with me Janet Manthe. She's a program manager and um, works directly in this region, in the Hartford region. And then I have two of our clinicians. I have Adri Toomey and I have Megan Birch. I think that's pretty, pretty good. That's, I think so. We'll make it work. Okay. Okay, so we've been in the business of school-based health for really more than 26 years at this point. We started in a little neighborhood elementary school in Middletown called McDonough. Uh, McDonough Elementary opened up with a comprehensive school-based health center. And um, when I first came, 15, well, almost 16 years ago, we had a medical, little medical operatory right off the nurse's station. We had a behavioral health clinician downstairs in the library. In fact, we used to, I used to listen to the um, concerts. They used to practice in the, um, in the library. Um, and so we were completely a mix match. Now, if you go to McDonough today, we have a full suite. Um, you know, grant dollars came in and, and retroed the whole place. It's a beautiful um, kind of showcase. So what's our mission? Well. Number one is to m promote and enhance the overall health of youth. And we do that particularly for the uninsured and underinsured, and that's part of the mission of a federally qualified health center. But for school-based, it's also important to ensure that kids have access to the comprehensive services that they require. So our process, we're always invited into a community. So primarily word of mouth. I mean, superintendents, we're in Meriden. Um, superintendents talk, nurses talk, teachers talk. Sometimes it's from my staff and they want services in the districts that their children are in. So I've gotten referrals from a, every, you can't imagine, everywhere. Um, parents have to enroll. So um, we have a pretty extensive enrollment form. Gets medical history. Um, and then uh, consents, consents for HIPAA and FERPA to have a level of communication, as well as consent from the parents so that we can see the children without the parent present. Although we always want to engage parents whenever possible. Um, school nurses, coaches, counselors, classroom teachers, all our partners. Um, we need them, they're our referral sources. Uh, we stay in touch with them, we collaborate with them. And then we're accountable to the Board of Ed. So we follow the policies. We're guests in the school, so we follow the policies of the Board of Ed. We provide some data updates on a regular basis if requested. Uh, we're qualified health providers, so all of our providers are licensed, fully licensed clinical, um, either APRNs for our medical and or licensed professional counselors, licensed clinical social workers, licensed marriage and fa family therapists. And then we have a variety of different models. So specific to Berlin is behavioral health and perhaps mobile dental. Um, but we also have fully comprehensive where we have medical primary care suites. Um, generally requires quite an extensive amount of space and not every facility can accommodate that. Obviously that's the Cadillac model. So I'm gonna let Janet talk a little bit. Hi everyone, I'm Janet Manthe. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about enrollment. So there's m many different ways that you can enroll. We have the old-fashioned paper, which in a lot of communities that seems to work best. It goes home with the student, it's returned to the homeroom, and then we'll come and collect them. We also have the online enrollment, which is available, and we have a website that you can log on to, and most parents, we thought, were gonna love that, and follow the prompts and fill it out, and it comes directly to us. We found that not everyone did that. So we went back to the old fashioned enrollment and we seem to get those in, but there's also that opportunity to do it online. I'm not familiar with your case. All right. Um, in school services provided to students who enroll. So um, we have, as Jane talked about, we have the comprehensive sites, which are the medical, the behavioral, and the oral health. We're just looking at the behavioral health for Berlin, um, but just to go over the medical so they can diagnose, treatment, physical exams are really big in the schools. We do a lot of sports physicals for the students. Um, chronic disease management, that would fall under your asthmatics. Of course, the immunizations, 
health education, we'd love to have the kids come in and the nurse practitioners do um, some classes as well. They'll go out and they'll talk to the gym teacher who also forms as the health teacher in most schools and they'll do different presentations. But for Berlin, we're talking about behavioral health. We're in every school in Meriden and that's one of the schools we, or one of the regions that we talk about a lot as well as New Britain. Um, I'm looking over and looking at Adam. I'm, Paul actually was my teacher back in Roosevelt, and then also I worked with him when he was principal at New Britain High. Um, so for behavioral health, we do crisis intervention, individual counseling, groups, family, and referrals uh, for psychiatry. And oral health, I'm not sure if we're gonna dabble in that with um, Berlin, but we do screenings, exams, cleanings, x-rays, sealants, referrals, a lot of education as well, and some restorative care. Now it's mobile equipment that would come in. So every six months, we would love to see the students. If the calendar allows, we would see them twice in one calendar year. So we're more than just your average health care. Their self-esteem, everything we talked about. We have crisis response, peer relationships they work on. Um, we have the two clinicians here and they can tell you about different groups that they hold. They do a lot of individual counseling, of course, but they also can form little groups and do really well with those students. So CHC school-based health centers, in school year 17-18, we reached over 17,390 students, our patients. So we do provide care in 181 schools across the state. So some of those locations might just be behavioral health, some may just be dental, but we are in 181 schools. 32 comprehensive, so that's, as Jane referred to, as our Cadillac model, which is the medical, the behavioral, and the dental all in one. 55 of them are uh, the fixed behavioral health and mobile dental locations. 94 mobile dental only locations. And as you can see, we have uh, a large area of where we have uh, schools already. So we'd be adding Berlin to that location list. Um, locations and services, that's our, you're right, that's our map. That is the map of Connecticut. Right. And for billing, so billing, um, we see all children without insurance. We accept the state and the commercial insurances. Um, there's a few um, out-of-pocket costs, and that would be for mobile dental. It's not for the behavioral health or for the medical. If the child has private insurance, there's usually a copay attached to that. We do not accept copay, so there's no exchange of money. Students are coming to school with money. If um, what we do is it's waived, thank you. The, the, I know at one time we went through, right. So those are all waived. Um, we, we also have an access to care team and we'll help any family that's looking to get care. And they can either come out for insurance and, or we can meet them. We have uh, several locations, the closest one would be in New Britain. Thanks, Janet. So this is, these are just some research-based outcomes. Um, but I mean, anybody that knows a kid that's healthy is gonna have better outcomes. So in the academic, it improved, you know, healthy kids improve health status. We reduce absenteeism, decreases the discipline referrals, increases parental involvement, especially for behavioral health, um, improves readiness to learn and increases the link between the school and the family. For the child themselves, it, increases understanding of health issues. They become a little bit more savvy around advocating for their own health care, increases positive health and safety behaviors. So we talk a lot about, you know, helmet safety and vaping and the things that are, you know, kids are peer pressures and what have you. Increases the ability to communicate about and advocate for their personal health care needs. And then for the community, there's lots of evidence of that it reduces emergency room use because we see the child before it gets to that point. Uh, attributes to a reduction in Medicaid expenditures, we're a lot more affordable than emergency room. Uh, assist families with insurance eligibility and navigation of system, that's what Janet talked about, with access to care. So, the final outcome is obviously healthy students make better learners. I wanna thank everybody, and we're here to answer any of your questions. Sure. <laughs> Thank you. 
Any questions from the board? Fire away, Jamie. So I already had the privilege of listening to these um, ladies. Um, we talked uh, probably a couple weeks ago um, at McGee. So I know some of the questions that um, we brought up is space-wise, um, where do we have the space at McGee and some of the other schools? Some of the other schools have um, more availability than others, but um, and I don't know if we came to a conclusion. We figured that we would find it um, because we're looking at the behavioral component part of that. I don't know what we decided about the. Do you want to talk about budget. what you need for space? Exactly. Sure. Um, so for behavioral health, we need an office space. Uh, pretty typical office space. Some of our behavioral health clinicians are in very small spaces. Um, others have more spacious. Um, so. A couple of chairs, a desk, um, we need a phone, we need Wi-Fi, we need an outside line for our phone. Um, it's a pretty simple kind of space for behavioral health. And then mobile dental, um, they, they can set up in you know spaces that don't have carpeting on the floor, that have access to water. It doesn't have to have water in, or a sink in the actual room, but they have to have access so at the end of the day they can bring um, their equipment there to dispose of you know dentist stuff <laughs> um, and it, their spaces gets licensed all the spaces get licensed so the behavior health is licensed by the Department of Children and Families and then the mobile dental spaces um, licensed by the Department of Public Health so just to clarify we asked um, for this presentation this evening to share with the board of what this program could bring to the district and then have some discussion on it so if there's any questions beyond that. Um, and the thought was definitely the social piece and then with the contingency of looking at that as a possible option uh, moving forward. So. Would this cause a conflict of interest with our school nurses? That's a great question, but no. Um, the school nurse would continue to do the exact same job she's doing now, which is responsible for the entire population. Um, and we're looking at behavioral health, but even in the medical component, um, the nurse practitioner in the medical component is a, can diagnose, treat, and prescribe, which are things that the school nurse cannot do. Um, and only, so we actually, like a lot of students would come to the school nurse and get sent home, where now with a nurse practitioner, they could go see the nurse practitioner, perhaps get diagnosed, treated, and a call, perhaps, if they need a prescription, and then mom or dad could pick up the prescription on their way home. Or they get diagnosed and treated and sent back to class, which is more apt to be what happens. Um, and, but for behavioral health, no, because I don't think a, a nurse is dealing with treatment, clinical treatment of children that need behavioral health services. Do you, you guys want to add to that? Um, no, I think that what Jane said is absolutely right and sometimes people get concerned with the social workers that we would like how we work with them and we do a very different job than the social workers in the school as well we work very closely with them we would have a release to speak with them if we shared a child or a student with them in the school um, but we would do a very um, a different job than them they would still do the IEP and the day-to-day -day, um, work with the children and the students in the classroom where we would be that individual therapist housed in the school to um, for families to have easier access um, and we can diagnose um, and do psychosocial assessments with the children. But we would work very closely with the social workers to do that. Well, and another point. I think it's also important to distinguish that we're, we're only working with youth that are referred specifically and enrolled. So it's not like we would be working with the entire student body, but specifically students that have been referred and enrolled by their guardians. ESS is, is run by us. This, this is like, instead of the students going to their outside therapist at Wheeler or at a private practice, this is that. So the school, right. The students don't have to go and get their services after school. They actually get their services school. We're a licensed not, outpatient not clinic. To the IEP, Child guidance clinic. To it, it, it really boils down to access. 
right? So the access is at the school versus somewhere in the community or another community you're driving to get that access. So you're not you're proposing to add services, not take, not replace anything that we currently have. Like at the middle school, we don't have ESS, but we've got different. Or you're not looking to take anything over. You're looking to augment and. Right, so we are what you could think of as a community child guidance clinic, but it's housed in the school. Um, and it it provides the access, like Superintendent Benini said, um, where we have almost a zero no-show rate, where if you look at community child guidance clinics, there's all the barriers for kids to get there on a consistent basis. I have another question about, um, you said the mental health component is managed through DCF. Correct? License. License. So do you work directly with DCF? No. no. Community Health Center operates the program, but we have to get licensed by Department of Children and Families. I'm just wondering if families have issues with that since DCF is connected. I don't think families would necessarily, it's a license. It's a, just sticks a piece of paper that hangs on the wall. Mm -hmm. I mean, we deal with DCF just like any of you do, <laughs> really. Right, there's no co-pays or um, out-of-pocket fees for insured or uninsured for behavioral health. So, so that's what. If you have a student that you are working with for, for an entire year, 180, 180 days, over the course of that time, you're not charging them or the We're billing out. their insurance and just receiving whatever the insurance will re re reimburse. Right, and if they went outside to see that therapist, they would be paying the co-pays Understood. and meeting their deductibles, right. So how much would this cost the Board of Education? Uh, just the overhead in kind kind of things, um, the you know heat, lights, the Wi-Fi, the phone line. Uh, you said DPHS, the license, the space that's provided? For mobile dental. for mobile dental. And I guess if we're in the it high does. school, yeah, in the high school we would have the DPH come out and look at the space for behavioral health as well. Just for the high school, because then we potentially have 18 and over, so they, DPH has to be involved for 18 and over students. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> Are you there on a daily basis, five days a week, and you adhere to the academic calendar set by the district? Good question. Um, so we provide the capacity based on the demand. So we would probably start with part-time in each school, probably half-time in each school, and share some clinicians between schools. If the demand increases, then we would work to increase the capacity of the clinicians. And we are, I'll let these guys talk about this. Um, we do work on a school calendar, so when you guys are off on April break and Christmas break, we are off as well. Um, but over the summer, you will have access to us. So we come in and do work days over the summer. So if we have clients that are high need that can't go, obviously, three months without treatment, we would come in and see them and be in contact with their families are and they, provide. So I know family therapy is a part, one of the services that was listed. So Absolutely. So before or after school hours also. We can. In yep. the school space. Absolutely. Okay. Yep. And um, given... You know, I, I know that you noted that there would be communication and obviously collaboration with the school-based individuals, which of course as school-based folks I think we would hope for, um, because it's sometimes very difficult to establish a relationship with folks who are um, working with our students outside <coughs> of schools, right, and, and um, that. But if it were that you're with, working with students on a daily basis and you're splitting time between schools, um, if a student's in crisis on a day, et cetera, would you come to be with them, or would you, how does that work? And, um, and I imagine too, so, so sorry, two-part yeah. question. I imagine too that sometimes when you are based in a school, folks in a school want to know what is going on because mm -hmm. we are collaborating with folks and there are probably some barriers to that with respect to HIPAA versus HERPA and or. Sure, I'll answer part and then I can okay. 
give it to me. So I am in two schools right now. So uh, I am back and forth between New Britain and Bristol. So when I'm in New Britain, if one of my students in Bristol is in crisis, it's a 30 minute drive. So I'm not necessarily going to drive there, but I will speak with the student over the phone or I will help the nurse or whoever that student is with um, walk them through and help determine you know best form of action um, and plan for that student and vice versa. Um, so that's how we would handle that. If, if I am you know, in New Britain and one of my students in New Britain is in crisis, I would meet with them, um, you know, I could meet with them in that moment and do a crisis. We would be 211 for that student. So if a student is enrolled with us, we do act as that emergency mobile crisis. So you would not have to call 211 um, on a student if they are enrolled in behavioral health services through CHC, school-based. Um, in terms of HIPAA and FERPA, we will obviously have all appropriate releases taken care of at the initial intake. Um, the way that I frame it to the families that I work with is we're obviously providing a service within the school. And like you said, you guys are going to want to know where the students are. So obviously, we're going to have passes. And a lot of times with younger kiddos, we'll escort them to and from sessions. Um, but I let families know it's not like we're going to be telling the child's life story to their teachers, but it is important that we're collaborating with you guys. Obviously, if we're seeing behavior changes or ways that we can implement certain um, interventions and working together, yeah, you know, that's information that will be shared. Um, but I think that certain details don't need to be provided on, on certain things too. So respecting privacy, um, you know, legally, but absolutely, you know, collaborating. Is that You're so accessible, right? which is a good thing in most instances, yeah. I would assume. But. So I know you need the state funding, so that goes for the un or uninsured <coughs> individuals, that how, how that works. <laughs> uh, so we would not have any direct funding. Uh, we would sustain ourselves based on the insurance revenue that's generated from the visit. So if they're uninsured? So if they're uninsured, if that's what you're asking, what we'll do, they are seen, and what we would hope is that we can have access to care come out and meet with that family and get that student. I mean, we don't push for that, we'll ask. Um, there's students that are undocumented, so of course, those are students we're still going to see, if that helps. I just had a couple of questions. I mean, so first of all, I understand the behavior health. I mean, that definitely seems very logical, and certainly can increase access. Um, I mean, is medical care a consideration here? Is that also um, a consideration? We didn't really talk about medical care to start. We okay. talked about the behavior fees and the potential as far as dental. But, you know, space is an issue with the medical and also to look at the need of the medical. You know, we didn't really have I mean, any discussion. I wanted to share the size of the space that's needed. Because we asked that question mm -hmm. when they came up. The space is huge. Um, so for, for the space? So for the space for medical, what we would have is we would have one exam room and we would have a waiting room. So we have a nurse practitioner. We have a medical assistant that serves also as a receptionist. So we would have a small waiting room. So if you were to look at a medical. 10 by 10. Yeah, a 10 exam by 10. 10 by 10 space with a separate entrance that would be private where the students would wait or family coming in for a physical with the receptionist so they're identified you know um, so in other words when once they walk in it serves just as an outpatient clinic if you were to think of one of the minute clinics something like that they would check in with the receptionist and they would be triaged and the next step would be that they would see the nurse practitioner. So it would be a 10 by 10 space that we would need. For them, just, for the, just for the exam room. Yeah, but right. Mm -hmm. so, so with that in mind, even if we weren't gonna go down that road, I mean, it could be something arranged to even just like a, a flu shot day or something like that. No. Well, no, because it, it, it has to be licensed. And we, because we're federally qualified, we have to go through a scope application process and get sanctioned by HRSA, which we'll have to do for behavioral health as well. Um, much easier to expand if we start with behavioral health. It's easier to much easier to expand. 
the scope process is done, I can put in there, there may be a consideration for medical down the road, and then we can expand these. Enough. With medical, yeah, we can do it that way too, where there's a, you know, a district-wide comprehensive location that all kids come in for PEs and immunizations or sport physicals or flu vaccines. I mean, just out of curiosity, I mean, just in terms of logistics of that, I mean, is the, I'm, I'm trying to think this through, it's like, kid wakes up sick, bring them to school. Yep. Right. I mean, is that really how that works? It right. can. We have kids that come in in their pajamas and they get checked out and they go back home mm -hmm. because they're sick. <laughs> Um, but they may get their prescription called in and, you know, they can't get into their pediatrician as quickly or, yeah. We'll do things like strep cultures. So if the student wakes up not feeling well, mom's thinking, you know, let's go stop in the school-based health center and maybe it's just a regular sore throat. So we can do a strep culture, find out, yep, no strep. The student would, <laughs> sometimes the outcome for the student is isn't happy, but mom is. But it's, good, it's important to say that we don't replace their medical home. So we're not their pediatrician. We're just an access point. We still do a lot of flu right now, flu testing. Um, if they'll come in, if they have flu-like symptoms, we can go ahead and do a rapid flu, find out if they really have the flu. Of course, those are students that are going right home, things like that. Just the medical. Yeah. All right. If, if because behavioral want. couldn't start. Oh, no. Oh, no. You'd have to have need somebody in every building. Yeah. No, that's we across the district. Yeah. All five schools. Absolutely. Good start. I'm sure we'll have other questions as we digest everything sure. that we've, we've uh, heard tonight. Um, and we thank you for coming and doing the presentation. Thank you for having us. Thank you. And I'm sure it will be on another agenda <laughs> shortly. So. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And feel free if anybody would like to come see one of the clinics in Britain High. It's very close. Um, I'd be glad to show you around. See where a typical day looks like. Thank you. Okay. Thank, thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Uh, next up, we have revisions to the 2018-19 school calendar. Brian, sure. You have two copies of the calendar. Um, the one that has, the, if you look at June, the three green uh, half days at the end on the 12th, 13th, and 14th, that's the old calendar. What we're proposing is that we change in the other calendar that we change Wednesday the 12th and Tuesday the 13th to full days for students and staff and that we leave Friday as a half day for students and staff, that's Friday the 14th. That would give the students 181 days of school. And then Monday and Tuesday would become full PD days for staff. So we're doing away with those half days, which we feel that having PD for full days is more relevant, and also having students there for those, to finish that week out and not have to come back the following week for half days would be a better use of time um, and still allow for the 181 days. So this was student achievement earlier this evening. Rich, anything to add to that or? No, I think the idea makes a lot of sense. Going on, a, having two full days of PD at the end of, after school ends makes much more sense in terms of productivity and effectiveness of staff. Three half days in a row really doesn't make a lot of sense. It's very difficult to get quality work done at that point. Yeah, I, I, I agree with you, Rich, and I think the parents will appreciate yeah. this more also. Families will also. Yeah. yeah. Right. Any other questions regarding the calendar? Hearing none, we'll entertain a motion. Move to adopt the revisions to the 2018-2019 school calendar as presented. Motion by Julia. Second. Second by Rich. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? <laughs> motion carries 8-0. Underlined, underlined, underlined. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, next up, we have the establishment of the Berlin High School graduation date, which will be effective after April 1st, uh, which I believe is the 
statute. Yes, it is. yes, yes. Um, so we're gonna hopefully establish the graduation date and hope that we don't have a snow day in the next six days. <laughs> so with that, Brian. Yes, the date we're looking at is April sixteenth, which is the. June. April. I'm sorry. June. I'm sorry. June. <laughs> <laughs> April. Uh, it's after April first. Yeah, thank you. Sorry. After April first. <laughs> So it doesn't go into the fact if we happen, there's no snow excited. on the forecast um, <laughs> for snow, thank you. There's no snow, snow forecast before April 1st here, that's what I was thinking. So our traditional uh, graduation date would be April 6th, April again, June 16th, <laughs> June 16th, which is Father's Day, uh, Sunday at Wealthy Hall. Good. Questions about graduation date, which is June 16th? <laughs> thank you. All right, hearing none, I'll entertain a motion. I move to set the Berlin High School graduation date for Sunday, June 16th, 2019. Motion by Carrie. Second. Second by Adam. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries 8-0. Jen, would you please let Alex know that he's busy on June 16th? <laughs> yes. Right, we thank you. Sing. Yeah, we're going to put <laughs> him up to <laughs> sing. Tell him he's singing. Yes. <laughs> All right. Next up, we have an update and discussion on the budget. Um, it says Brian will give the update, but I think that I can give them a quick uh, like that, yeah. small synopsis here. Last Tuesday, uh, the Board of Finance voted to reduce the Board of Education budget $1.3 million, uh, which in essence, cut our request in half. Um, and at the same meeting, um, voted to put the $400,000 that we requested for security personnel. That was carried, if you remember, in that account number 61 into our operating budget um, because they felt that that's where it belongs. So while <coughs> if you do the very simple math, that's a $900,000 cut, the reality is it's a $1.3 million cut to the operating budget with $400,000 allocated to security because we have said all along they're separate and distinct. We shouldn't need to choose between teachers and security and the security portion is an add-on to our operating budget. Um, with that information, I then asked Brian to work with his staff to uh, come to us this evening and let us know what $1.3 million worth of reductions looks like. Um, and he has brought forth uh, some recommendations. All of them are painful to say the least. Um, I'm going to try to go through this, Brian. but. Let me know if I get anything wrong here. So the first up is $300,000 will come out of our contracted services, which in essence is ESS, which makes up 280,000 of that. Um, this will be the third or fourth year now that we are gonna hope to fund that program with dollars that if Brian, man Brian and Jeff managed the business this year well, we will be able to fund it out of this year, and if we don't have the money, then it simply is not gonna run. That would be the first reduction. Um, Brian is, has recommended that we take $400,000 out of the tuition and transportation of um, our special education program. Uh, if you remember, we did have some uh, anticipated placements uh, outplacements in um, special education and in essence what we're doing here is rolling the dice in hopes that we don't actually need them even though Linda has already shared with us that she knows who the students are. Um, there's a $500,000 reduction in um, Certified salaries. We're talking about five to six positions across all um, levels of teacher reductions. 
and um, last is a one hundred dollar reduction in uh, excuse me hundred thousand dollar reduction uh, still on the April <laughs> um, in general out of the general operating budget relative to supplies and what the district needs to operate on a regular basis we're in essence Brian is telling me that he's going to go back to his administration they're going to make additional cuts in the supply lines and so forth um, one of those items um, is actually with us tonight is we will stop contracting with uh, the nutmeg TV um, and we'll start to stream that internally that's a that's a ten thousand dollar a year um, reduction sorry that you had to hear that tonight um, and that's that's where we are that gets us to 1.3 million um, Brian I'll, I'll turn it over to you and you can talk about what the impact of that is and I can then kind of talk about what I'm hearing is may, may be else be coming down the line those are the potential areas that I outlined um, I would like to hear from the board if there's discussion on those areas and thoughts um, the biggest being the five to six teachers um, those would be teachers at the secondary level and potentially at the elementary level which would mean the elimination of some courses um, and would obviously elimination of some services um, where they will be specifically we're looking at vacant positions obviously looking trying not to displace people from their current employment so we'll be looking at the retirements that we have um, any non-renewals um, and then trying to make adjustments as such um, to carve out the five to six positions to come up with five hundred thousand um, dollars the supply budget was already cut um, coming into the 5.96 we will try to squeeze another hundred thousand dollars out of the supply account across the district um, contractor service I think Matt you know spoke of that the ESS has never been part of the uh, operational budget it's been put in two years in a row um, but it's never been funded um, our hope is that there's end-of-the-year funds to cover that again and the tuition in, and transportation that is a very much a variable number um, that can change overnight with students that move into the district or it can change if students are coming back to the district and with what transportation is our, what transportation is needed by students um, is, is there's great variability um, in that so um, those that would be the large scale to try to get to the 1.3 I think it's important that we hear the voice of, of all of the um, all the board members on this because this is the first time that I can think of where we've received a cut like this and have actually had to go specifically to programs right away. Um, we've talked about some support things in the background that we've been able to do, but over the last five years now, uh, those reductions have been made and now, you know, at first blush, we're already here. Um, and I will let you know that I have heard, uh, and it's only speculation, and again, it's hearsay, so let me make sure I'm clear, but there may be up to another million dollars worth of reductions coming from the town council. And if that's the case, uh, there's a whole nother list of things and we need to make sure that everybody's on board that that's what we're looking at here. So, Jamie, I see you. Um, this is probably a contentious topic, but instead of looking at certified salaries, if we look at the sports programs and moving to a pay to play on all of them, what kind of savings is that? We looked at the pay for play or pay to participate last year, and the offset was, I want to say, somewhere between seventy and a hundred thousand dollars across the district right. for everything. It was not a huge number; it might have been a little less than that. How about um, for clubs and all extra. Yeah, we did action. pay for participate, and it, like I said, depending on how far out, and then you put caps and things. There was various models looked at because um, that there was a discussion on that, and we actually spoke about if there is going to be further cuts should we look at fees is that something to start to begin to look at whether it's pay to participate whether it's parking fees and things of that nature the, the issue with that is you're passing those expenses down to specific families now as many things are getting passed down to individual families um, rather than spreading it out across you know the tax base so um, those are all things to think about my concern moving forward is you know the next step if there is another round of cuts 
next step, you know, where do we go next or what's the recommendation to go forward? Because um, this is a very drastic cut. We went from 5.96 to 2.98. So it was this essentially a 1.3 cut our increase in half. And if you remember correctly, our contractual obligations were at two point something. So that's just to meet contractual obligations. So obviously cutting five or six teachers will lower the contractual obligations because those are the contracts and so on. So you're decreasing there to some degree, but. Um, I think Jamie, the answer overall is we're gonna have to consider it all, yeah. right? So. It just, it's, I mean, if, if you look who's here and we have a discussion tomorrow night, which I am concerned that we will have a very similar audience. And I don't know how to, um, mm -hmm. the importance mm -hmm. of what we're talking about. And five teachers certified salaries or however many, um, which will, will probably, as you said, Matt, there, I also heard that it will be more than just the 1.3 million. So we're looking at more than that. So where do we have a discussion where people actually I, want I, to? Yeah, I hear what you're saying. Yeah. Because as I look at the proposed um, reductions, my, my concern is that um, while it's impacting probably a pretty small segment of our student population overall, that sub-segment is um, among our neediest or most vulnerable. Yeah. And so, but they, they represent a small percentage other than those who may be impacted by obviously the classroom changes and the reduction of salary. So I understand your point, Jamie, because we won't have people coming out in droves yeah. mm -hmm. um, to, to voice their uh, concern or opinions about that. So, and, and it doesn't happen until people are personally impacted by it. Right? So we know, yeah, we know that middle school sports is about a hundred thousand dollars to run a year. So we, as a board of education, can essentially make the decision today that rather than five hundred thousand dollars coming out of certified salaries, it's four hundred thousand dollars, and we're going to reduce middle school sports today based on this cut. We have the ability to talk about freshman sports. I don't know what the number is, but. Brian can probably find it relatively quickly. We can talk about reduced JV sports. We can talk about um, scheduling. We can talk about fees. You know, um, one of the questions that comes to me is if we impact, put in activities fees uh, or parking fees is what's the offset? Well, the reality is, is the offset is more than likely transportation fees because we have to transport our kids from the high school to Sage for almost every sport with the exception of basketball or we have to transport them to a pool someplace or because we don't have those facilities. And that would kind of be the offset, right? So yes, we're charging those, those people to participate in these activities. And, we're, not, and, and we, we're, we're talking about all activities. So we're talking about robotics, we're talking about any of the clubs, anything that's out there to offset some of those other expenses. So even if we're talking about, uh, I think I saw you write it down here, Seventy to a hundred thousand dollars. Seventy to a hundred thousand dollars is an offset someplace else, and it whittles away at the overall. And it's a difficult, it's a difficult conversation, and it's one that that is keeping me awake at night, right? So we've had these conversations before, but now we're at the point where the administrators have been reduced, the support staff has been reduced, the secretaries have been reduced. Any we've. We've looked at classes that at class sizes that, that have been running, and we've been taking those down. We've, Brian's provided us with all of the charts and all the graphs. So, Rich, I'm I, off the soapbox. No, it's okay. <laughs> Actually, I, I'm even more concerned, quite frankly, about the tuition and transportation in this special ed budget. Because to me, as you said, rolling the dice took the words out of my mouth. It's wishful thinking. Linda has told us repeatedly that we're getting more and more kids that are moving into the district with high needs. The, one of the graphs I think you showed us during the budget presentation showed the special ed money, the percentage rising dramatically every year over the last few years with less and less reimbursement coming from the state. The idea that we might not need this 400, I think we're probably going to need much of the 400, in which case what else do we then cut of existing services if we have to pull some of that 400 off the table in the middle of the year or even in September or October. 
then you're stuck with another one or two hundred thousand that you have to find somewhere. You're going to have to take away from an existing service somewhere. That concerns me. I think looking at that, it would not be the initial cut that we would look for. It would have to be down the road if we couldn't find the additional funds, which we would have to. It could possibly mean layoffs in mid-year. Right. It could possibly mean cancellation of programs. It could be you know a lot spending of spending freezes, spending yeah. freezes and yeah. things. But you know that doesn't. This doesn't immediately impact programming. Right. It's students. down the road, and you don't it could know. Be, we don't know. It, it, it's a question right. mark. It is definitely right. is. That's concerning, obviously. Yeah. yeah well, I, I get I, it. I, the options yeah, I, I don't think. Minimal. Yeah. Right. I don't. Right. You know, wherever we go, it's concerning. I mean, this is not a good situation in any way. I don't think that any of us has the the solution to this. It's just no, this is just gravely cool. concerning. <clears throat> so yeah. I mean, we know that yeah. one point three is already been reduced. Um, <clears throat> so I, I think per, oh, go ahead. perhaps the even the greater the rate, greater concern is where we go from here. If there's going to be additional cuts past this, and then potentially if history tells us anything that that budget gets voted down then there may be even additional cuts on that um, I think at once we get past this I think the ideas of fees um, whatever they bring in I mean we have to look at everything um, so that's definitely something I could see happening and seeing us voting on um, I guess the question to me is what does the district look like Brian, if we really go down this path where now this 3% gets whittled down to a 2, as as history has shown, um, I mean, do we have the technical education? Do we have those options in high school anymore? We're definitely going to lose either programs or staffing. You know, it's not going to be the same education that was before. The opportunity is not going to be, you heard me say that repeatedly. So do you raise class sizes at the elementary? We've already taken any of those small classes at the high school. Do you eliminate certain programs at the high school? Do you look at McGee, and currently McGee has two exploratories. Do you look at McGee and only have one exploratory per day for students? Do students now, they receive art, they receive art, sixth, seventh, and eighth grade. Do they only have art in sixth grade because you only have one teacher versus two teachers? Whatever you do, you're changing the opportunities for students. There's, there's no other way around it. Whether you cut sports, co-curricular programs, it's still opportunities for students. So your question, what does the district look like? It's really up to us to decide what, how do we protect the core and what is the core and what is most important within the district. And do, in doing so, I think you have to look at some of the pieces with co-curricular. I think you have to look at the fees. I think you have to look at those pieces and say, you know, we've really had a strong commitment. And if we have to get to the point where we're looking at elementary class sizes, then I think that poses a whole other discussion about how we're how the, how the elementary schools are structured if we have to go up in size. We've no, we don't have elementary class sizes at 28 students. You know, that's something that's unheard of. You know, having 24 is not even something that we typically have. We've had a few in the past years. So, um, you know, we, last, last time we got to this point, we looked at elementary media specialists. And, you know, which is actually a special for students in, in there and the proponent of Component of reading, they do. They don't. It's not that they're just a librarian checking out books. They're teaching courses. They're doing so much more with the students. Um, you know, tech and tech integration specialists. We look at our technology program that we built one to one and start to dismantle that. Something has to give in order to get to that number. Unfortunately, um, I mean, this also this, this also brings into the real conversation of if we are going to increase class sizes at the elementary school, then the study that we had put together now puts the concept of restructuring the elementaries, doing something different perhaps with the Hubbard School front and center, and we heard the people speak. We know that they don't want to lose their neighborhood schools, but this is no longer about what people want. This is about dollars and cents. And if the study shows that there is a significant savings to the program and we're going to continue to be funded as we have in the past, then in my opinion, all things are on the table. And it, it comes down to what does the community want and what are they willing to vote for and pay for? 
I, I think the frustration is that large disconnect. Um, I mean, when the decision was made to not run some of the high school classes with very low enrollment, less than 10 kids, clearly the community spoke and was very unhappy of, about that. Unfortunately, that same community didn't come out and vote positive for that same budget that made us make these difficult decisions. And, and, and I think that's really the challenge here. I mean, Julia, I think, has done a great job in terms of communications, in terms of what we've done in terms, in terms of Berlin Citizen. I think anything that we can do to let this message maybe resonate to larger than those in this room um, would be advantageous. Adam? It's, it's sad, again, that we're, we're sitting here talking about history repeating itself. I think we were here back in 2002, 2003. And the result was no middle school sports, no freshman sports, no extracurriculars, no homecoming, um, you name it. Um, <coughs> and unfortunately, it was that point that caused a lot of the parents to, to band together to, to actually vote and become active. And it's unfortunate, again, that we're at this point in time where underfunded over the course of so many years, there's no place else to go. All the tricks, as we talked about it before, not even tricks, but just the funding options of not filling positions for the full year with the principal or assistant principal or assistant superintendent. I mean, all the things we've gone through over the years, reducing the number of administrators, reducing the number of teachers, there's no place else to go. And now, I'm, I'm, I'm pained right now because I was involved in trying to restore those programs back in 2003. And now that my very own children are in high school, middle school, and elementary school, I'll probably be left with making that vote of whether or not to take those programs away from them. So even my own children won't benefit from it. So that's a, that's a sad state for a town like Berlin that has the ability to pay, has the ability to do things. And quite frankly, if we were doing a better job raising the grand list, bringing in business, bring in more funding in that area, we wouldn't have to have this debate year after year. Right. So it's not a matter of asking for so much over the course of, uh, of years. Listen, there, were, there was a decade where the Board of Ed was funded and things were done, things were renovated, you know, things happened. It, it's not out of the realm of possibility, just whether or not people have the will to get it done. So I'm, I'm very disheartened, disgusted that we're even talking about this, but until people come out and vote, and when we have a, a large audience of citizens, if people come out to budget hearings, if people come out there, we have a referendum where less than 10% of the people come out and vote. We have a town that has the biggest issue on the ballot every single year, having 8% people come out decide the future of our town. And what do we do? The elected officials take that 8% and they look at it and say, well, this is exactly what we're gonna do. We're gonna cause havoc and we're gonna cut and slash and do everything else. I think it's a wrong idea. We have a charter revision to add another layer with the Board of Finance now. How many referendums do we have? It's, it's so convoluted. If you're an elected official, make a decision, stand by it, move on. These referendums, I think, are out of, uh, out of control. So that's my soapbox. I think to the point people are making, you know, with the community getting upset after the cuts have been made, um, and we have no place else to turn, and the work that we've done as a communications committee, in Brian's email and his update, you know, this past Friday, there was a link to events, uh, school events, PTO meetings, where he's speaking and presenting the budget. And I think as a Board of Ed, we need to come together and show our face and start speaking out and shaking hands and talking to parents and letting them know what's going on. Because, you know, if you hear from the same two or three people over and over and over, um, but I think once they start seeing our presence out in the community over the next month, it's gonna make a big difference. And, you know, I encourage all of you guys to go home tonight, open up that email, look at that link, start putting your names in things and just start getting out there. That's the best way we can do it. Brian consistently tells me that he keeps getting feedback about when I was running and people saw me out and people were talking to me and how effective that was. And I think we have to take that same mentality from now until referendum and really just start reaching out to people um, in our community and sharing what's going on because that's the only way they're gonna know. They're not gonna open the citizen if they don't. Um, they're not going to come to a Board of Ed meeting because Mondays are tough for every single person. Um, they're most likely not going to watch that Meg TV. So we, we need to get creative with this. 
Can we talk procedural just for a second? Sure. I don't mean for us, I mean for the budget. Mm -hmm. So tomorrow night is the Board of Finance's presentation to the town, right? Is it tomorrow, tomorrow night? Tomorrow's Correct. The town, the tomorrow's the town forum. Town, town forum, I call it town forum. I want to get the right wording, a town right. forum. And then on April Monday, April 1st, is the town council meeting where they'll either discuss and or act on the town budget and on the education budget. The Board of Finance yeah. on Wednesday, do I have this right, John? Will vote to finalize their budget to go to town council, correct? And the council has five days. They have up but to five days. that's where right now the agenda is posted for the whole course. No, I, 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 I'm, it's on my phone. So there's an agenda posted right now for the town council on April 1st to discuss and or act on the budget proposals that have come in. So we have a very limited window into the four people that we're sitting here, the six people that we're talking to. This is very frustrating. I don't want to just continue to be frustrated, but um, we're going to be forced to make some very unhappy decisions. We also only have one board meeting in April, too. So there's only one board meeting. And it is very possible, as Matt said, and some others have echoed, that more is going to be cut. So in addition to rolling the dice on some of the things that are in front of us, we're going to have to make concrete cuts in addition, more than likely, before this thing goes to referendum. And that's, and that's where I'd like some direction from the board of where to go next and where the board's position of going next. Because the first budget proposal was my proposal to you. Then it's your, your budget once you adopt it. And now the finance board and town council will make additional cuts beyond that. I mean, I can give you recommendations as I did tonight, but ultimately I'd like your input on what you're thinking is the direction to go. Should we get more cuts? Or if you even like the 1.3, how we're looking to, at this point, obviously we can change, at this point, how we would meet the, that $1.3 million cut. I don't have an answer to any of this. And I've said it before, um, and I'm, I'm probably bad opinion, I shouldn't say it. I think we gotta hurt. I think we have to have people hurt. And I don't, I think if you say you're taking five or six teachers away, which I'm completely against all of this, by the way, I don't know that parents are gonna see you took the teachers away. I think they're gonna see when you start taking things they want away. It's like having a child, what do you do? You take things they want. I don't know what the answer is, pay to play, obviously. I, first thing I would cut would be sports, drama. And I hate and I don't want to, I've got boys. I've got kids that are in the system. I don't want to cut anything. But like I've said before, they always think the community knows no matter what, we will survive. We will bring ESS back. We will bring whatever back. I mean, they came out for the fire thing and there was like four people enrolled. For some reason that hit a nerve. I think we have to figure out what hit a nerve and another thing, I want to say, like, thank you to all of us. This is like we've, Brian's been to all the meetings, all the PTO meetings. You've got the PAC community is getting phone calls going to have people come out and vote. We've got the citizen article everybody's been working hard on. And I think everybody's done a great job, more so than we ever have, of getting the word out. So for that, awesome kudos and thank you. And it stinks, and I don't know any answer, but I, I did. I mean, the paper. I think it should hurt. So, <clears throat> some of the potential cuts. What? Sorry, that's what I, I was trying fine. to say. So, Thinking. I just said I don't think we have a choice. It's going to hurt no matter what we're. I know, but I mean, like, no, like I, it's got to no, be I something that people yeah. fight, and then they're going to be like, we have to have this come back. That's like we took the assistant principals away. No one cared. No one cared. Well, that was my earlier point actually we're still that criticized that we didn't do it they, right, they think but I we mean, didn't do it it's because it, yeah but i mean it, we're, they, it doesn't affect them even taking teachers away eh, you know but, they're yeah. not it's a, so I th go if, ahead, if i could say last year the direction from the board was to look to make cuts for a million dollars and we tried to, or i tried to make those cuts across the district administrators teachers non-certified you know that is straddled everywhere and really places that maybe we could have had cuts this year it's they're not just not there the cuts the the the, the extra is not there to make those cuts um but the thought is if there's further cuts yes we could say another 20 teachers and what does that do to the district 
But the other things we talked about, the fees, the McGee sports, freshman sports, half JV schedules, co-curricular. We pay have to a, park. We, ha we have a large number of stipends. Pay Even if it's only $1,000, like pay to park. Yeah, mm -hmm. your it's stream. just you're, you're getting that conversation the, out there, even the, if it's a tiny bit. The fees, parking at the high school, yeah, pay fees for co-curricular, not just it's sports, not just but, all. but also we have preschool peers that attend half day in our preschool. Other districts have fees for those. Not that it's a lot of money, but they do have fees. Um, we have a, a number of stipends. The majority of them are at the high school. That if we eliminate all stipends, and that would mean certain clubs when it runs, certain activities when it run, it really changes the whole dynamic of what education, and my belief on education, is more than just what happens in the classroom. It's also what happens beyond the classroom, beyond you know the two thirty dismissal. Um, you know, at the elementary, we go. talked in the past, uh, past years of budget cuts, media specialist, tech integration specialist, which drastically changed the education that students are getting and what I believe is some of the cutting edge education that we have. You know, um, elimination of an admi another administrator would be difficult to do, but you know, and it would be more teachers. That's really the, the only directions that we have. It's, it's people and it's programs. There's, there's really nowhere else to cut. We're taking supplies down almost 20% with an additional 100,000. So y y there's not enough in supplies to keep taking those. It's just not there. I, 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 just a, a variation of, on what, what, what Tracy's saying, it's going to hurt. And I think even this last year, it is hurting. I think the problem is, is that there isn't a connection with the hurt and what the budget was. You know, people were hurt by losing the firefighting class. People were hurt when there's behavioral issues in the school because if there's not enough resources to deal with those. People are hurt by that and people will be hurt by these issues. If there's larger class size, if we have to not run certain close classes, there is gonna be hurt because of this. You know, and I, and I laugh because you're talking about cutting all the extracurriculars. I'm not talking about sports, I'm just talking about the programs and the clubs and everything else. What's the first thing a student does, Jenna, you can attest to this, when you're filling out a college application, the colleges don't, they care about your grades, but they want to see about everything else you're doing. And what, what else did you do? Well, nothing, because our school didn't offer it. Mm -hmm. I mean, how sad is that? I feel like our parents that are sport parent, club parents, anything extracurricular, those are our vocal parents. There are booster clubs. There are the ones that are up doing car washes, and they're doing all sorts of out in the community. So those are the ones that we need to Absolutely. speak up and say something. We have a very low number of parents that come out and vote. And we need those people who are the vocal ones and the ones that get angry to come out and say something. Which is why I go right to the sports and right to the extracurriculars because you're absolutely right, Adam. Those are, when I think of my own kids, and when you think of college and whatnot, it's all the extras. And our, when we had our board retreat, we talked about the entire kid, the social, emotional, and academic. We're completely obliterating that by even having this discussion because of you know, a, a budget that is ridiculous in a town that doesn't come out and speak. So, those are the people that we need to come out and say something. So I don't know how we present tomorrow to the 10 people that will show up, but I think if we say, you know what, this is what we're taking away, this is what is going to happen, then maybe it will go out and maybe people will get angry and come and say something and vote. Well, that's what I want. I want people to say something, to be vocal, to spread that word, to, you know, exactly. tell their 10 people, to tell they their 10 people. They have to get angry. They will not come That's out in this Absolutely. Place. So is our direction to Brian this evening, and I think I know the answer already, to modify what he's already recommended to include these items that are going to hurt, and we as a board are going to stand behind that. <laughs> and ultimately, that's, that's the question, is, is if we direct to do that, and we, we ask for those recommendations, then when, we, when I stand up there tomorrow, I need to know that all of you sitting here with me are in support of that as well. I, I'm 100% on board. I would absolutely take away Just sports before I do the tuition and the thing. But if other people are not, then obviously. I, I, I'm, I'm not. I think, I mean, the issue is, well, first of all, 
Um, I mean, let me understand. Is, is, let me understand a little bit of procedure here. So the cutting in half of the, from the, the Board of Finance, mm -hmm. is that up for debate? No. Nope. Is that going to change? So It may change in the direction right. opposite Canada of what we want it to. have the Board of Finance at our meeting and go through the budget line by line? I'm sorry, I, I mean, I'm frustrated. Did, you, did we not have the Board of Finance at a meeting that went for several hours and we went through the budget line by line? Everybody was there. The mayor wasn't Except there, but everybody from the Board of Finance was there. How do people believe that there's still an inflated budget when they sat with us and went through all of it? I just the the way that the the board meets and talks is it the same thing where you have a you know a audience of citizens and you have to wait to be called upon to talk and right for the board of finance. So I'm just going off of what Rich said, that there was a discussion already line by line of what the budget was. So is it now we talk, I, I don't understand how to have a different, I understand, I'm really talking to you guys. 
Is Mark at the meeting on Wednesday? Board of Ed that needs to come to these meetings. It's our community members that need to come. So if we could get 50, 100, 150, 200, 300 people to come to the Board of Finance meeting or come to the meeting that is the agenda is for the first, that's really where the conversation needs to happen. It's not just us. We have this conversation all the time. It's getting other people there and doing it in a matter of a day and two days because we have that thing tomorrow and then we have again on their meeting on Wednesday is really what we need to do. It's not just us representing someone at the meeting. We've done that. Nothing came of it. I don't know what you guys think. I think that's right. voted on it yet. You guys don't do that till Wednesday, correct? Finalize it. So if you had a huge amount of people that came in and couldn't change your mind, I mean, it's a possibility before you actually vote on it, right? talking in circles however you know especially to the five people that are here tonight but I, I gotta tell you I believe that our task is to oversee the education of the town of Burlington and the task of the town council is to help the town grow and they have failed miserably in recent years at every turn the town is stagnant the grand list is relatively stagnant so we don't have any more money to do the things that we need to do. I mean, you're going to lose, continue to lose kids. We're going to continue to potentially lose schools. I'm talking about Hubbard and having to make decisions that nobody wants to make. But we're being forced to make them because there's no new money coming into the town. And that's because there's no new businesses coming into the town. It's very frustrating. Tracy? I probably can't do that. And here I am getting a more extreme. How much is it? Would we save money closing Hubbard? I'm just, you know. We couldn't do it for next year anyway. So, so we, we wouldn't be able to do it for next year. And I year. don't want to close no. Hubbard, I will say right. that. Right. Right. There's nobody here that wants I to don't do want that. To. But as I said, we have to start considering all future decisions because this isn't going to change next year. We're going to have the same conversations perhaps next year and as I said we heard we heard the community they don't want us to do that they like their neighborhood schools we like them too it's now becoming a dollar and cents decision and that's that's sad that we have to have that conversation so I still think it's important to communicate 
and John spoke of it, what that number is relative to the number that we need yearly to sustain ourselves. And to think that 1.38 at a five-year average is okay, it's not okay. And there are other towns that are listed there, which are contingent towns around us, they're not surviving on 1.38 either. So to ask us to do that, I think is unreasonable and unrealistic, even given the debt services and so on, because the town side is, right now is at six point something, their budget. But yet ours is at three. Three really was the number, if you look back five years ago, that we were receiving close to three a year. We were able to operate and sustain ourselves. Um, but the 1.38, when I spoke to PTOs and faculty, that's the part that really stuck in people's head. Well, how can you do it if others can't? And the point is we really can't do it and provide the same level of services, the same opportunities to students. That, to me, is, is the message that needs to be communicated to the grade. Most parents said we were never aware that you were only getting 1.38, and it's not even it's not close to other towns are receiving. So, I mean, that percentage alone leads to what has to be cut yearly. That, that number is what necessitates the cuts. Um, and I don't know where the board sits on that as far as the number, but to me the number is the arguing point. The town, and John, correct me if I'm wrong, the town has made it clear that if below that 6% or 6 point, whatever they're at, they'll have to cut services. Am I correct? That's what was said at the finance board. And the finance board said, well, we don't want, we don't want services cut. But yet we are, we are cutting services at that 1.38. Um, at the at the 2.998, um, and if we go further deeper, we're going to cut even more services. Um, you know, whether they be opportunities, whatever they may be. Um, and I, I just believe that that number that we've had is unrealistic to move forward, and that number has to move because we can argue about what we need and the cuts, but it's getting the public to understand that we need to be close to three percent annually to sustain contractual <laughs> obligations and, and move the district forward. So I think in everything that everyone has said here, we have a, a, we have sort of a short game that we need to address and a long game. And I don't think we can, um, we can get the public informed enough and motivated enough and build mo enough momentum in a week's time. I think we need to get in front of the Board of Finance and or the mayor. Um, in that short window if we hope to affect any change immediately. But over the longer course, I feel like what, I agree with what everyone has said in terms of it needs to be made clear to the public that in fact this will affect them. You know that old, I forget, I tried to look at my phone while I was sitting here, but you know that saying by, I think it was a German poet, where it was like, you know, until basically it comes down to until they came for me, and then there was no one to speak for me kind of thing. So as long, yes, re re referencing the Holocaust, that's a horrible analogy, but, um, um, but it's people don't come out to, you know, in droves and with pitchforks and torches until it has something that impacts them, which is exactly what people have been saying. And I started off by saying, you know, I appreciate what Brian suggested as sort of large cuts, but to me, it affects a very small segment of our population and therefore won't leverage the assistance we need in terms of people coming out and making um, their voices heard. So I think we need to, my, my proposal would be um, to get in front of and try and make our case very aggressively um, in front of uh, the politicians in our in our town but then also start building understanding among um, a larger group of citizens and talk about and potentially deliver on what could be the cuts that would affect um, more of our community so. so steps obviously tomorrow we have the presentation at the town forum Wednesday uh, I will, for one, will be at the meeting with the Board of Finance on Wednesday night. Uh, hopefully we will have other members there as well if they are free. So, so Seven o'clock, John? Seven o'clock on Wednesday. Um, I think that we, 
will need to attend and get the, our, our message across again on April 1st. Um, Brian has already done yeoman's effort to get in front of PTOs and parent groups. We know that some of them are already uh, getting together. In fact, I think they're meeting tonight. Um, the question comes down to that Brian asked originally is he's asking us for direction on what, where, where he wants the recommendations to come from. Uh, it sounds to me like a majority of this are, are to make them, Tracy's word, hurt, right? right? Um, I don't have a better one because it's going gonna, it's gonna to be what motivates people. Um, there's, a, there's obviously a, a perception out there that the Board of Education probably has too good a, done too good of a job managing the money because a lot of the reductions are invisible to the everyday person. Yeah. So kudos to Brian and his staff and the, the administrations before him to have been able to do that Unfortunately, it creates a public perception of, oh, don't worry about it. It'll all work out. Well, it doesn't seem like it's going to work out this year. So tomorrow we'll talk to the folks that come. Wednesday night we'll talk to the Board of Finance. A week from tonight we'll talk to the Town Council. And then we'll... S we'll, we'll have to make difficult decisions. Mm -hmm. There's going to be difficult ones all the way along here, but Brian, do you have what you need from us? Yeah, I, I, I can look at other cuts. I guess the question, you know, if, I, I just got to go back to that 3%. Right now we're at 2.98%. If the board believes that that is the number, annually we should be at about 3%, then my suggestion moving forward is that we outlay tomorrow night what the potential cuts would should we fall below that three percent i think i still i believe wholeheartedly that that three percent is the number that has to be the benchmark that we need to be at yearly just contractual obligations at two point something never mind the others so i think tomorrow night that's got to be the conversation tomorrow night that's going to be the conversation finance board that we need to be at three percent minimum and if we're not these are some of the cuts that we're looking at uh, to, to that we'd have to look at in order to try to you know sustain ourselves and keep the ac keep the academic side right which I believe the education is more than just you know the end of the school day but I think we need to have a message like that tomorrow night about the three percent and that being well, that, a number I, and I think we have to keep in mind of what Mr. Richards said and that is three percent is the baseline but right. we still have five years of catching up to do we need three percent plus a little bit over the next number of years in order to and get us to, to, be, right. to the right baseline. Right. And then once We've you hit been, baseline, you can remain right. stable, but. Yeah. I mean, it, look, I, I think we made, we have said that and that's true. Um, my concern is, and I, I don't support Brian going back and trying to change this. I mean, the point is that we are tasked to take this money and minimize the hurt to those students. I mean, we're, we're not going to sleep at night trying to specifically try to try to make a point. The point is, is that if we cut past this 3%, which is what, I mean, at this point, quite honestly, I think we're trying to hold the line on this 3% because we're, it's only going to go down from here. It's going to be possibly cut by the town council and then perhaps not, and then vote down upon that. I think once we, if we get past this 3%, absolutely, this pain is going to be around for everyone. Um, I think that's the only difference that I'm trying to say. Certainly we need the catch up and without the catch up, now we're talking about cuts of services and I think Brian has did a great job of trying to minimize the pain, but we're gonna continue minimizing the pain, but, but the pain's gonna go around if it goes past the 3%. But I think it might be short-sighted to look at the proposed, and this is, I don't mean this as a criticism, but I just taking sort of a 30,000 foot view here, if you think about this as minimizing the pain initially it's minimizing the pain because it's affecting the fewest well, a relatively few number of students and or staff members but the implications for cutting something like ESS are going to tax 
Linda's budget yeah. because there will be more referrals and so it will tax the staff within special education. It will have an impact on students outside of those within the SS as will the tuition and transportation because it is we will become legally obligated to pay for outplacements regardless of whether we put them in our budget or not. So that money will come from elsewhere in order to fund this, which means that it will have implications for students beyond those that would be you know, within this targeted population. So I think it's actually misleading <laughs> to look at this as only, get, there's the ripple effect is going to sure. impact. You Com know what I mean? Completely agree. This is not, nothing anyone wants to do. This right. list is, is, is absolutely painful. I think we all could agree with that. I'm just saying spinning it <clears throat> might be helpful <laughs> in terms of getting people engaged. Right, a quick question on the 400,000 on the transportation base. Where did that number come from? Why 400 and not 300 and then 100 somewhere? Why 400 from that? Because we looked at the we looked at what transportation needs we had, which is which are tied into the placements and the outplacements, and we thought we could have some savings there. That's really where it came from. Any more comment on this? Obviously, top of mind topic here that keeps, I'm sure, all of us awake at night. Uh, if not, um, I'll close the discussion on budget. We'll present tomorrow night and let's move on to our next <coughs> item facilities related update. I have nothing for you uh, tonight, Mr. President. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Cugno. Jeff. Thank you for that. Good job, Jeff. <laughs> um, next up is we have the second reading of our policy review and revision. Um, at the end of this, we do have action on this particular one. So we have. Uh, Policy review re revision, second reading slash adoption on policy 1011, the non-discrimination community, policy 1250, visitors and observations in schools, policy 4111.1, minority educator recruitment, policy 4112.51, employment clerks. Yes, you got off the hook on this one. <laughs> Policy 4118.14, suspected abuse, neglect of adults with intellectual disability or autism. Policy 4118.241, suspected abuse, neglect of children or sexual assault of students by school employees. Policy 4118.55, retention of electronic records and information. Policy 5113, attendance, truancy, and chronic absenteeism. Policy 5125, confidentiality and access to student records. Policy 5131.6, drug and alcohol use by students. Policy 5141.21, administration of medications in schools. Policy 5141.25, management plan and guidelines for students with food allergies, glycogen storage disease. Policy 5141.4, child sexual abuse and or sexual assault response policy and reporting procedure. Policy 5142, physical restraint and seclusion of students and use of exclusionary timeouts. Policy 5144, student discipline. Policy 9035, meeting conduct. Uh, this is the second reading for these items. <clears throat> First reading was held on March 11th. Any questions, comments on any of those policies? Hearing none, I will accept a motion and someone else is reading all the numbers. Move that the board adopt revised policy 101112504111.1, What is it? <laughs> I don't even know. Decided it's double. I don't know. I want to go back and forth. <laughs> 2.51, 4.1, 4.1, 4.1, 4.1, 4.1, 4.1, 4.1, 4.1, 4.1, 4.1, 4.1, 4.1, 4.
5142, 5142.5, 5142.5, 5142.5, 5142.5, 5142.5, 5142.5, 5142.5, 5142.5, 5142.5, 5142.5, 5142.5, 5142.5, 5142.5, 5142.5, 5142.5, 5142.5, 